It's a battle that's been raging for decades, the battle against Lyme disease. Over the years, progress has been made against this dreaded tick-borne illness, but with breakthroughs come even more barriers, pushing doctors, researchers, and patients down what sometimes feels like a bottomless pit of despair. It is a fight that rages on, a fight that could be signaling a new chapter in this ongoing bout against Lyme. We're here in Winding Hills County Park in Montgomery, New York, a beautiful respite. And yet many here in the Hudson Valley feel hindered by their environment because of Lyme disease. In Orange County, 82% of the tick population has tested positive for Lyme. For the next half hour, we'll examine the progress being made in the battle against Lyme disease. Everything from research and testing to developments in medicine. We'll also take you to the newest battleground where Lyme rates have skyrocketed. And we'll introduce you to the teen who has turned her diagnosis into a rallying cry. But first, an investigative reporter living and working in Ulster County, New York. She has spent her life exposing malfeasance, so it was only a matter of time before she turned her attention to Lyme, an epidemic of global proportions. I think we've reached a tipping point on Lyme disease that says we don't have this disease figured out and we need to go back to the drawing board on it. In the heart of the Hudson Valley sits the hamlet of Stone Ridge, a town established 66 years before the United States declared its independence, a place that has some of the highest rates of Lyme disease anywhere in the world, where the conversation about how to combat it cannot be escaped. Yes, I had had Lyme disease. My husband had had Lyme disease. We were very familiar with the risk of ticks, but we were among the lucky ones. It is perhaps the perfect setting for award-winning investigative journalist Mary Beth Pfeiffer to tackle her latest project and solve the enigma of Lyme. We haven't done the work. We haven't spent the money on Lyme disease. There's a lot more we need to do. Her book, Lyme, the first epidemic of climate change, is an origin story, a first of its kind look at this crippling disease. Because Lyme disease has been framed as easy to diagnose, easy to treat, it has been a disease without urgency. We need to bring some urgency to Lyme disease. Bit by bit, Pfeiffer attempts to unravel the mystery of Lyme, digging into the prevalence of ticks around the world, the controversy over testing, and what's needed to eradicate the disease. Ticks are moving far and wide. They're being carried by migrating birds to places where migrating birds have long brought them, but now when the birds drop the ticks, the ticks survive. They breed, they make more ticks, and they bring Lyme disease to new places. Her conclusion, a warming planet is at the root of the Lyme pandemic. I took the point of view of climate change as a starting point for my book. Because Lyme disease is global, because it's spreading, because we did this. We caused this problem. We didn't create it, but we have abetted it. Mary Beth, as I look at the jacket of your book, you have coupled two very controversial issues here, Lyme and climate change. Are you concerned by putting these two things together that people may doubt your theories or your research? But I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in climate change as to what is causing climate change, but there's little doubt that climate change is abetting the movement of ticks. Pfeiffer's research shows this is an illness that demands international attention, but as with many issues, the United States must lead the way. Other countries rely on our research from our esteemed institutions to tell them how to treat this disease. Lyme, the first epidemic of climate change, chronicles how we got to this point where tens of thousands of people could be suffering in silence with little aid nor acknowledgement that their illness is legitimate. For a great many years, Lyme disease has been controlled by a very small, relatively, number of people. People with access to the highest powers in the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. People who are connected to the New England Journal of Medicine. People who can get their research funded by the National Institutes of Health 
and can get published in major medical journals. They have controlled the debate, the discussion, the funding, the treatment, the testing. It's legitimate research. But there's another set of research. There's another view of Lyme disease. We have to give that side as much attention as we've given the mainstream side that has ruled this disease for many years. Her hope is for a more equal and balanced debate, one that pushes the conversation forward and ultimately leads to a world where Lyme no longer exists. Next, the latest target of a tick explosion, New Jersey. How the Garden State is taking on this mounting threat when we return. You've heard about Lyme in Connecticut, Lyme here in New York. Now, what about New Jersey, the Garden State, the newest battleground in the war on Lyme? Antoine Lewis tells us why. New Jersey has become the latest battleground state in the fight against Lyme disease and with good reason. There were more than 5,000 reported cases of Lyme in New Jersey in 2017. Nationally, diseases from ticks have doubled between 2004 and 2016, so this has followed an upward trend since then. And similar to national trends, of course, diseases from ticks and mosquitoes have also increased in New Jersey. Data shows counties including Morris, Hunterdon, and Monmouth had significant increases in cases reported over the year before, contributing to the highest total statewide in almost two decades. I think you have to look at that and say, is it truly um, an increase in the disease in the state, or is it merely an increase because of awareness in the state? Pat Smith is president of the Lyme Disease Association. Smith believes more awareness played a major role in the high numbers. Once they put that out, I, I believe it was like the floodgates were opened because people looked at that and they said, this is a lot of disease. We had no idea. People that knew me and knew the work I did, I didn't know New Jersey had that much. I didn't know that this disease was that big. For years, a huge roadblock in the fight against Lyme disease was getting major support from federal lawmakers. But House Bill H.R. 665, the 21st Century Cures Act, broke down that barrier by establishing the Tick-Borne Disease Advisory Committee. The bill was co-sponsored by New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith. A comprehensive bill to try to take us uh, into the realm of cures, uh, expediting what is often a very, very laborious process. Yes, you want safe and, and efficacy, efficiency uh, in all the drugs we use, uh, but you don't want it to be so slow that the patients who are suffering are ill-served by the process. H.R. 665 was one of a dozen bills Smith introduced over the last 20 years to raise awareness of Lyme and tick-borne diseases among fellow members of Congress, many of whom showed reluctance. Twelve separate pieces of legislation uh, and frankly, the committees of Congress would not take them up. Uh, they were heavily lobbied by the Infectious Disease Society of America to say, don't take up the bill, uh, and others lobbied against it too. And the congressman is still writing. H.R. 5900 is currently navigating Capitol Hill. It calls for a national strategy on Lyme and tick-borne illnesses, as well as create an office for oversight within the Department of Health and Human Services to be the strongest advocate yet for an illness that more than 300,000 Americans are diagnosed with every year. And Representative Smith has more fighting to do. A lot of people in Congress are reluctant to go after Big Pharma as they say, why not you? That's a great question, uh, particularly in New Jersey where Big Pharma is big. Uh, I believe that you put the patient first, you put the person with the disease or the disability first, and the rest will follow. Next, a new vaccine to prevent Lyme disease is on the horizon, but like all things Lyme, this isn't without its own controversy. We'll explain when we come back. A new vaccine that could stop Lyme in its tracks. It may soon be a reality, but it's also the source of a heated debate. Carrie Drew examines the controversy over a cure. It could be a game changer in the prevention of Lyme disease. A new vaccine to protect against the fastest growing infectious disease in the U.S. is now on the horizon. By introducing a vaccine that would prevent 
um, Lyme disease, especially for people living in endemic or risk areas, uh, we would not only have a, a huge medical benefit, but also um, a substantial health economical benefit. Thomas Lingelbach is the CEO of the French biotech company Valneva. Last year, the company received fast track status from the FDA for a vaccine called VLA-15 and recently completed a successful phase one clinical trial. The company says the vaccine stimulated an immune response and the tested population had no serious side effects. We conducted a phase one in around 180 subjects um, with a primary objective related to safety and the safety profile was absolutely as expected, even a bit better than expected. A vaccine to prevent Lyme disease has been released before with controversial results. In 1998, a company called SmithKline Beecham licensed the vaccine called Limerix, but it was withdrawn from the market in 2002 after class action lawsuits alleged it caused side effects such as arthritis. I think a safe and effective vaccine would certainly be welcomed, but the problem is that there has been a failed vaccine, if you will, uh, in this country, and unfortunately, at the time of that happening, it was done under uh, circumstances that people felt were not very transparent. Pat Smith from the Lyme Disease Association says she has serious safety concerns about Valneva's vaccine. They've been fast-tracked, so fast-tracking removes some of the safeguards that are put in when, when drugs and things are marketed, and it cuts down on the amount of time. Well, is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. When you have a product where you're concerned about it because of past issues, then maybe, yes, maybe that is a concern. Well, that's a grave concern to those who looked at what happened last time and say, well, wait a minute, how do we know this isn't going to, you know, uh, do that again? But Lingelbach says Valneva's vaccine is different. It protects against six strains of Lyme disease, while the old vaccine only protected against one. And the company also cut a gene sequence that was possibly related to arthritis. Our vaccine has been re-engineered in a way that there is no protein sequence included that has any homology to human sequences um, and as such um, is supposed not uh, to bear any risk um, in terms of, for example, autoimmune reactions. So now the big question is when might we see this vaccine? In order to gain FDA approval, Valneva will need to complete three phases of a clinical trial. That could be just a few years away. We believe we are approximately five years away from uh, submitting for licensure. With the phase two entry, which we anticipate by the end of this year, we will probably see a two year phase two execution timeline. And that will be then followed by the phase three um, to be conducted. We are really doing and undertaking any effort to accelerate the development as good as we can in order to provide uh, such a desperately needed vaccine. Now to the doctor, gone rogue, turning his passion for fighting Lyme into a personal crusade against the status quo. Here's Arthur Chien. Dr. Sin Lee is what you'd consider a crusader, a pathologist, yes, one who 10 years ago started looking at the lack of early detection of Lyme disease in patients. The current test for antibodies is flawed, Lee says, because the antibodies don't form in our bodies for over a month, and tests before then can come back negative even if the disease is brewing in a patient. The important thing is to catch Lyme disease when the bacteria, Lyme spirochetes, are traveling from the skin to the lymph node, to the heart, to the joint, to the brain, and to catch them when they were traveling. So in 2008, Dr. Lee started using DNA tests to look for early signs of Lyme disease. Within two years, he had a breakthrough, published his findings, and presented it to the scientific community. The CDC, our nation's leading public health agency, approached Dr. Lee, asking to work together to improve early detection. Lee says he set up a protocol at their request showing DNA testing detects if someone has Lyme disease weeks before it shows up in antibody tests. And this is where things get mysterious. Suddenly, communication with the CDC went cold. They disappeared. They did not respond at all. Was it Didn't phone say, calls, emails? No phone call, we sent an email, we for a phone call. 
uh, they never answer. So basically dead. Lee says through emails and phone calls, his repeated attempts to contact the CDC all went unanswered. Unwilling to accept the dead end, Lee opened his own testing laboratory in Milford, Connecticut with his own money. Today, they receive samples from across the country, $150 tests that insurance does not cover, which Lee says is why the CDC's actions are important here. With the CDC endorsement, the insurance company will pay for it, right? The hospital administrator will be willing to spend money to, for the test. And Lee says those who truly pay are those who get Lyme disease and don't find out until it's spread, until a month after being infected. Until the bacteria already gone into the deep tissue like the heart, the brain, and joint. This is where the crusader Dr. Lee comes in. He's filed a $57 million lawsuit against the CDC for suppressing early detection testing. Fox 5 contacted the CDC, which says it cannot comment because litigation is pending. When one hears of a lawsuit being filed for $57 million, it's natural for even the non-skeptic to wonder, is this about the money? So we asked that directly of Dr. Lee, and he says if he wins, he will take every penny of it and funnel it to nonprofits to establish testing facilities across the country in areas dealing with Lyme disease. And there is one final piece to Lee's crusade. He wants his lawsuit to open the doors for those suffering from Lyme disease because of late detection, for them to be able to sue the CDC. Lawsuits against the government are hard to win, but Lee says he'll give Lyme sufferers all the data from his case they need to do it. Very few people have the data I have yeah, available to them for any lawsuit. Right? I make it available to everybody to use it. <laughs> Who actually gets the last laugh, we may find out within the next two years. Next, taking a leading role in the fight against Lyme. How a 13-year-old is turning her diagnosis into a plan of action, helping others battling the disease. Stay tuned. A 13-year-old girl with Lyme disease is doing her part to find a cure. Kayla Mamalek tells us about the charity work that has earned this talented teen national acclaim. Well, the first time I heard the word Lyme's disease, I thought it was the fruit, and I thought that I had, like, eaten too many. At just eight years old, Olivia Goudreau was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Today, at age 13, she's created a nonprofit called Live Lyme, which has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund Lyme disease research. Dr. Zong at John Hopkins University. I am helping him with his essential oils phase two. And with Dr. Sapi, my grand helped her test Lyme disease and medication on skin instead of in test tubes. She's been honored by Stanford University. My mom said, not many 13 year olds get to see Stanford. <laughs> Presented before federal health officials in D.C. I spoke in front of CDC, NIH, and DOD. Oh, and she just launched a smartphone app called Tick Tracker. We use geolocation in real time from what other people say. The junior high school student is a force to be reckoned with, though her path has been anything but easy. She was very gray. She looked washed out. She looked tired. We didn't know if maybe there was like a virus going around in school. Olivia first remembers getting sick at age six. She was bitten by a tick during a family vacation in Missouri. When second grade started, Olivia says she had body aches, brain fog, a tremor in her right hand. She even started blacking out. I was in and out of the hospital and I had tests that I didn't need and a lot of doctors were telling me that I had to drink more water and one of them told me that I was diagnosed with Wilson's disease and that I would not live past the age of 40. 18 months and 51 doctors later, Olivia was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Day in and day out, she still battles the incurable disease, using Live Lyme to power forward and help others. Part of me realizes the impact that I'm making, but since I'm still only 13 years old, I kind of think, oh yeah, I bet a lot of 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds get to do this. So I think that, yeah, it's definitely impacted me. 
It's important to remember it's not just Lyme disease. There isn't only one type of tick, and they don't just carry one strain of bacteria. Information is key. And so for that reason, we have posted this entire special and all of our interviews on our website, fox5ny.com. You can also head to our YouTube page for continuing coverage of Lyme and Raisin. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at Fox 5 News, I'm Teresa Priolo. Goodbye.